Hi, and welcome to the show. Subscribe at kevinmd.com slash podcast. Get CME for this episode by clicking on the CME link in the show notes. Today, we welcome Courtney West. She's a pediatrician. Her Kevin MD article is titled, Breaking the Cycle of Failure in Modern Medicine. Courtney, welcome to the show. Hi, thank you so much for having me. I'm excited to be here and share my story. We'll get into your article in a little bit. First off, briefly share your story and journey to where you are today. Great. I am a pediatrician. I grew up knowing that I wanted to help children in some form or capacity. I always had an interest in autism in particular. Fast forward, finished residency, started at a traditional outpatient clinic, decided that the system was not exactly what I wanted. You know, as we all know, going through what should be 30 minute visits in five seconds, led me to start my own DPC practice and concierge style medicine where I was doing house calls. Then my family relocated to Pennsylvania while I was here. Ended up doing a lot of psych medicine because the pandemic started and had a lot of teens that we were focusing on mental health issues. From there, I started my own similar DPC practice where I focused mainly on mental and behavioral health issues in children. In this whole process, I have two neurodivergent kids, so have spent a lot of time researching not only for my patient's benefit, but also for my own children's benefit, which then led me to finding integrative medicine. And that's kind of where my article came from. And we're going to talk about this later in your article, but when you first came out and started practicing what we're going to call, I guess, traditional pediatrics, Tell me about your day and what about it specifically wasn't your preferred style of practice? So I had a lot of patients who were on medical assistance and it is difficult to, their medical literacy is lower, right? So in order to teach them what I felt that they needed to be taught, even just about, you know, basic Mm -hmm. Uh, feeding children, like what they know is completely different than what they should be doing. And it takes a lot of time to explain that and offer preventative guidance and appropriate anticipatory guidance, which is what pediatrics is all about. And I found myself just really trying to spend a lot of time, like making sure that they knew how to give a medication or how to properly feed their child and that you shouldn't put Coke in a bottle whenever they're five. Just basic things that seem like common sense are not common sense to a lot of people. And and that it just took time. So then instead of being able to focus on medical issues, we were really just, you know, kind of dealing with a lot of social and, you know, basic living concerns. And it just couldn't do that in five, 10 minute visits. Now, you made the next step of going to some type of direct primary care practice outside the system. And not everyone would do that. A lot of doctors would just stay in the traditional system because of financial security, job security, and whatnot. But you made the leap to go into something that is relatively less common. So what made you take that leap when so many other doctors would rather just stay with that security in a traditional system? Well, I have a very supportive husband, so I realized that I am not the primary income earner, which made it a lot easier. And I did have a security and safety net and his support in being able to do that. And I'm so thankful. The main reason that I triggered it is, uh, you know, it was like the arrival fallacy, right? I was in residency. I was like, oh, I can't wait to get out of residency. It's going to be so much better. And then you get to your first, you know, real job. And I was like, this is not any better. So I I figured I had to do something different and I had to make a change. All right. And you talk more about your journey in your Kevin MD article, breaking the cycle of failure in modern medicine. Now tell us, how did your article come together? Yeah. So like I said, so one of my, two of my children have, you know, some medical issues. And then my third child actually was a lot more. It was, it was just a lot of things that seemed common, right? He had eczema. Okay. No big deal. Mm -hmm. But then he had recurrent croup, which, okay. Also maybe he's got reactive airway disease, but we're talking like he was in the hospital for it twice, kind of bad. So and then he had constipation. And so it's like all of these little things just kept adding up. And what really triggered the investigation was I walked downstairs one morning and he was pretty much like non-responsive, limp like a noodle. We took him to the ER and his glucose level was 38. And then he got an idiopathic ketotic hypoglycemia diagnosis, which is, you know, 
I, I had actually never seen it in residency, but I will tell you now that I've been in practice, it's not super uncommon and we do see it. I was just not happy with the diagnosis of idiopathic in a child who also had a lot of other issues. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I didn't mention, but we were having significant behavioral problems with him as well. And so it just seemed like there, you know, we're taught like there's got to be some sort of like, you know, reason that can, or we try and find a unifying cause. And I was really anxious to do that. I had done, you know, a lot of different like genetic testing, nothing was coming back positive. And so I went down the functional medicine route. I actually started doing an integrative psychiatry fellowship so that I can incorporate some of these tests and philosophies into my own practice just knowing like and seeing all of the research that's coming out on the importance of your nutrition and your microbiome and our brain health. And in doing so, anyway, long story short, I found that he had really elevated mycotoxin levels in his urine, which led us to investigating in our house. And we had had a leak in the bathroom mm. next to his room. And there was just mold all inside the drywall. I would Whoa. have never known had I not started looking into this. And now this has opened up this entire journey, which is just phenomenal and fascinating that we aren't taught this in medical school and it's not really, you know, like discussed, but I just, now it's like kind of like the veil has been lifted and I see everything from a different lens. And there's so much that we don't talk about in our environment that contributes to our health that I would love for the traditional allopathic system to sort of just even be open to listening and investigating. Now, when you were taking your son to the traditional medical system, trying to find a reason for these disparate symptoms, tell us a little bit about your interactions with the traditional medical system. It it's it's sad because I felt like I had to be guarded or else I would be looked at and judged, honestly. I can recall there was one situation where we were in the hospital and I asked them to add or add some nutritional labs. And the physician looked at me and was like, well, I don't know what to do with that. So I can't order it because it's not really going to change anything. Mm -hmm. I was like, well, I mean... I'll, I'll do it. Or can we like look at it? But it was just sort of like, it just kind of got dismissed. And I felt like I was, you know, crazy or being judged. And yeah, it's just sad. Now, before you went down this integrative medical pathway, let's say you're, you're on the other side of, of, of the curtain, say, and the patient or patient's family asks you to order labs that you may not have learned about in medical school. What do you think your reaction would have been? Similar. So I'm not judging, you know, and I, I had patients. So I have a, a distinct memory of a patient who had gone to a naturopathic physician and they asked me to order these labs. And I went and I looked at them and I was like, I don't know what this is going to do. Like, you know, let's not do this. Let's do this. I did order most of them just because I was curious and I actually did go and do extra reading, but that takes time. And I, I realized, like recognize I don't have that time now with four kids that I did whenever I was like first starting out and had a DPC or direct primary care practice with limited number of patients. So there is no judgment, but I also think that, that if we were taught this in our education and to be more open to alternative you know, types of methods and testing, then it would be a lot easier for us to collaborate with other physicians that are, are you know, other practitioners who are not allopathic physicians. Now, you use terms like integrative medicine and alternative medicine. And to a lot of people, these are kind of nebulous terms that can mean a lot of things. So in, in, in your case, what do you mean when you say integrative medicine or alternative medicine? Yeah. So whenever I say integrative medicine, I like to think of it as bridging other philosophies, right? So like there's Eastern traditional Chinese medicine and, you know, Ayurvedic medicine and herbals and, uh, you know, mindfulness practices and, you know, just looking at nutrition and 
that sort of thing. So in my mind, it's all encompassing of that. And then whenever I say integrative, I want to integrate that into my traditional training. You know, I'm not saying like, let's throw up the everything that I learned. And, you know, I know that antibiotics are going to be really important whenever you have a full blown sepsis, you know, but I'm more approaching the like overall healing and preventative aspect of it with things that we don't necessarily do in traditional medicine or unfortunately have time to do in traditional medicine. So give us a common case study or story from your practice that could really illustrate that integration between allopathic medicine and some concepts from other philosophies. What would be an example of that? I got an, a message thanking me the other night from a parent whose, whose daughter had really bad anxiety and she had been dealing with it and the pediatrician appropriately referred her for therapy and therapy wasn't working and you know they came back and and started her on Zoloft after the, the therapy wasn't working, which is of course what I would do. And I, I think that is a fine approach. Mom was leery of starting the medications and wanted to know more. So she came to see me. We did lab work, found that she had some nutritional deficiencies. Her iron was really low. Her vitamin D was low. So started her on vitamins and some probiotics, also in the process of doing a gut health test and an inositol, which is a supplement that has been shown to be effective in anxiety in addition to continuing the, her therapy and starting meditation series specifically for kids. Uh, and she's better without needing the Zoloft. And that's just so far, you know, and we also talked about her nutrition and exercise. And I'm sure her pediatrician did talk about all of this, but it's a lot different whenever you can talk about it in an hour long in the context of everything and explain why it's so important and why it's needed as opposed to being rushed through the mill and then being given, you know, a, a medication whenever these other things weren't addressed. So tell us what your practice is like now. So your experiences allow you to practice more integrative medicine and you have a practice that kind of focuses more on that. So give us a sample of a typical day and what type of patients you would see now. I see a lot of different patients. My days right now are a bit hectic because we did recently discover mold. So there's a lot of personal things going on in terms of house remediation and still, you know, trying to help and heal my children. So that's another benefit of having my own practice is that I can schedule around all of those things. But mm -hmm. I will typically see, you know, four to five patients a day. Sometimes I try, you know, sometimes I'll concentrate those into the morning, but that really allows me to dig into their particular needs. I've started using a genomic based test called Intellex DNA, which which is a phenomenal, it's not, it's a, a clinical decision support tool. So it's not, you know, an FDA approved test, but it does test your genes. And then I can really go in and say like this particular patient has this SNP, which affects how they, you know, process pesticides. So in their treatment regimen, we're really going to have to focus on buying organic food or the dirty dozen, at least, and avoiding different pesticides. So I've been able to learn a ton and really apply that very precise to different patients. So that's kind of what I spend my days doing. And then I have a lot of interactions with patients in between their appointments. So daily and messaging with the with patients in between their appointments. Now, you also mentioned that there were a lot of things in allopathic medical school that simply isn't taught. So if you're in charge of the allopathic curriculum, what changes would you make and what would you teach medical students that's not being taught today? Yeah, I think I think it's important to at least expose us to an integrative physician who and have at least one or two classes with somebody who has some formal integrative or functional medicine training. The, you know, it's, it is very scientific and very, you know, evidence-based. And one of the things is like the mycotoxins, for example, and mold, that's just not really addressed. I had a patient who I saw had aspergillus on a bronchial specimen and they just classified it as a contaminant. But if you look and you talk to most integrative or functional medicine practitioners, and this patient is having significant respiratory symptoms, that's not a 
contaminant. That's like a reason. And, you know, we don't learn about that at all. So I think, you know, just talking to somebody and having some of these case studies shown in medical school to at least introduce them to these concepts that, and that they are evidence-based would be helpful. Unfortunately, there are a lot of physicians who are, you know, on functional and do things differently and may take advantage of the system. But I would say that's few and far between. And the vast majority are actually really interested on healing patients. Now, if patients wanted to look for an integrative clinician, or if I, as a primary care physician, wanted to refer someone to an integrative clinician, what kind of questions should they ask? Because there are some, like you said, that are less than scrupulous and perhaps do it to sell, you know, whatever brand that they want to sell. What are some things that we need to look for to make sure that integrative clinician is legitimate? Yeah, I would ask for their their training, right? There, it, There's a lot of different integrative fellowships that you can look at that are certified. The Institute for Functional Medicine, they have different certification programs. I, for one, am not certified in anything yet, but I am actively taking these courses. And so I, you know, disclose that to all of my patients and tell them like I practice medicine and I have a medical degree, but I am very interested in this. And so I'm learning these things. And, and a lot of times you can also ask like where they get their, you know, supplements from Mm -hmm. and you can get their supplements you can get the supplements from anywhere and if they're pushing them specifically from their own i would think that would be a red flag for you because if they're doing that then obviously they may be wanting to try and make money as opposed to really helping and my final question courtney tell us some of your take-home messages they want to leave with the kevin md audience be open-minded Just because we don't learn something doesn't mean that it doesn't exist and always keep learning. Courtney, thank you so much for sharing your story, time, and insight. Thanks again for being on the show. Thank you so much.